Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Bob. I am alcoholic. I'm sober only through the grace of a God that I was afraid to believe in. I have accessed and maintained in my life through a process outlined in a book entitled Alcoholics Anonymous, the ability to remain sponsorable and a persistent and consistent effort in our primary purpose of trying to forget ourselves and help others and consequently I haven't had a drink or any mind or emotion altering medication since October 31st, 1978. Sometimes when I say that, I'm startled. I mean, it's like... Um, I want to thank Mark, uh, wherever, he, wherever he went. Oh, there he is. I want to, for picking me up at the airport and hosting me. And uh, I got a couple members of my home group here, Hunter and Tiffany. They're from here from my home group, and they know everybody I know. And so all the really good stories of how wonderful I am in Las Vegas have been destroyed now that they're here. And, um, I want to welcome the newcomers, especially Mike. Mike, with the less than 24 hours. Man, wow. So if you never drink again the rest of your life, Mike, you know, because of me, basically. Uh, make a little mental note of that. Um, you can just tithe every year to, to me on your birthday or something, you know. I want to welcome anybody else that's new. I'm glad you're here. I, I can't wait to hear what I'm going to say because I just, I just was on like a 30-hour flight, right, to cross the world, uh, 12 time zones. And so I'm not, I'm a little goofy, uh, my friends would, couldn't tell because I'm always that way a little bit, but um, we'll see what happens. We'll see what comes out. Um, I got alcoholism. I, I got a, a bad case of it. I, and yet for most of my life or all my life prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, I argued with it. I didn't want to be an alcoholic. When it says in the beginning of chapter three that most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics, boy, that sure is me. I don't want to be an alcoholic. I'll be anything rather than an alcoholic. I'll, I'm willing to be a drug addict. There's a little panache in drug addiction. I mean, there was rock stars that I looked up to who were heroes of mine that were admitted drug addicts. I mean, that's kind of cool. I'll be a drug addict. I'll be a mental health case because if you're a mental health case, you get pills and sympathy. I like both of them. I'm good with that. But I don't want to be an alcoholic because alcoholics are pathetic and obnoxious and... I don't want to be an alcoholic. And, but I got alcoholism, and people who argue with the truth get sick. And I argued with that truth, and I argued with who and what I was for years. And As it says in our book, uh, through every form of self-deception and experimentation, we try to prove ourselves exceptions to the rule. Not alcoholic, because I don't want to be an alcoholic. But I, I got alcoholism. And I've had it, I, I, I don't know if I had it before I picked up my first drink. I know I was a little weird before I picked up my first drink. And I, when I found alcohol, my weirdness seemed to go away temporarily. I, I, all those feelings I had of not fitting and this awkward inability to, to connect with people the way I watched other people connecting with each other. I couldn't do that. First time I ever got drunk, man, I could, I, I could come out and play. I was free. I loved it. I, it was like I was, I was like a pretend human being until the first time I ever got drunk, and now I don't got to pretend no more. I don't have to pretend I'm not afraid because I'm not afraid. I don't have to pretend I fit because now I fit. I don't have to pretend I'm okay because I'm okay I'm super normal. I mean, I went from 
being the kid with, hanging out with the older kids, the tough kids that didn't fit, man, always coming from behind. To, after about five or six drinks, I, I was their leader. I mean, I just knew it. You know, I'm, I mean, I loved it. I loved alcohol. I loved the effect produced by it. I, it, it allowed me to, to, to play in a band and sing. It allowed me to dance and go to d- pick up girls and talk to girls. I couldn't talk to girls. Man, I'll tell you, if it wasn't for alcohol, I'd probably be celibate to this day. I mean, I couldn't, I, I couldn't, I just, I was too locked up, man, too locked up with fear and insecurity. But alcohol set me free. And I loved it. Well, I got alcoholism. I don't know I have alcoholism, but I do. And what, what that means is I got that definitive characteristic that when I start to drink and the effect of the alcohol, I start to feel that feeling. I just break out in an irresistible yearning for more. Man, I'm just, and I, and, and my more takes a lot of different forms. I'm the guy, if I was at your house and we're drinking and all of a sudden it's gone and there's no more, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to either go leave and go get some more, or I might go into your bathroom and go through your medicine cabinet and just take whatever's there. Half the time, I don't even know what I'm taking. I'd like to read the labels. If it says, do not operate heavy machinery, this could be good. <laughs> if, it says, if it says, may cause sleeplessness, that could be good in a different way. Uh, and I just took stuff out of medicine cabinets because I, because once I've lit the fuse by drinking, I gotta, I can't, I can't get satisfied. And I, I, and sometimes I'd, I'd get pills out of people's medicine cabinets, turn my legs to rubber. I'd just be falling around. And uh, One time I took some stuff out of there. I was, I was up for about a day and a half. I was going to change the world. I, gonna, I got this plan. We're going to change the government and everything else. And it was amazing. And one time I got just really very regular. Um, <laughs> I ate all the pills off a wheel, and I found out later there's no chance I'll be pregnant in my lifetime. (laughs) And why do I do that? Is it because I'm a pill head? No, it's because I got alcoholism. And when I light that fuse, man, I can't put it out. And it's always been true, and yet I couldn't see it. I remember, as I went to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was probably 19 years old. I was in a treatment center, and from for the next couple years, I was in and out of AA, and I would hear people in AA talk about this allergy to alcohol and this phenomenon of craving, but I don't have that. I mean, I get drunk. I'm in trouble. I get arrested. I lose job. Yeah, yeah, I get all that, but I can't see the cause and effect of the allergy because of the way it uses my own mind against me. I, I'm sure I'm not the only one that's ever gotten in a lot of trouble drinking. And I, that happened to me. Trouble, if you're an alcoholic, you know some trouble. And I was having one of those mornings where, man, it was bad. I'm sick and I need a drink, but I'm afraid to drink because the night before, man, I, I don't remember everything I did because I'm a blackout drinker. But I remember little, little bits and pieces of it, and it just makes me shudder in shame. And there's always, you know, there's always those people who just live to tell you what you did the night before. It's like Christmas for them, you know what I mean? And, oh, you know, and I'm getting little bits and pieces from other people, and it's just horrible. It's, it's frightening. I'm thinking, this is oh, it's disgusting stuff. I could have went to prison. This is really bad. It's embarrassing. Now, I don't, there's, now there's a whole group of people that saw me last night. I don't want to ever see them again. Right? And I'm nervous, and I need a drink bad, but I'm afraid to drink, and I don't know what to do, and I got, I'm supposed to meet some guys down at the bar, and we're going to shoot some pool and have some f- fun, and I got to meet I want to meet them. I need to meet them. I need to have a drink. But I don't know. I, God, I can't do what I did last night, man. I can't. This cannot happen again. So I start thinking, and it's for a guy like me, thinking's like trying to carry water in a net. 
it's 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 a it's a it's not a good kind of deal. I can't get much traction in thinking except I keep going back to the finding ways to drink. So I think to myself, okay, I can't get in trouble like I did last night, but I've got to go meet my buddies. And you know what? You know you know what? I'm just gonna have I'll have eight drinks. Eight's a good number. Eight's a good. Just thinking about eight. Eight's enough to get a nice buzz, have some fun with my friends, shoot a little pool, have some laughs. Eight drinks is good. Never got in trouble with eight drinks. Never punched a cop on eight drinks. Never did anything. Never tried to take my pants off over my head with eight drinks. Eight drinks is safe. It's comfortable. It's it's secure. I'm good to go. Eight drinks. And I'm on my way down to the bar with a feeling of confidence. Eight drinks. It's going to be good. And if you've ever done that, it's a funny phenomenon. When you get to seven, <laughs> you realize that eight's a bad number. <laughs> and I don't know that that's an allergic reaction to alcohol, because in me, it just seems like I changed my mind. It seems like I, I have better information now. <laughs> And so I got alcoholism, and I don't know it. I I was probably 10 years sober, maybe. I don't know. I was sober a long time. And I was at a meeting. People were talking about, there was a couple people there that talked about cross, you know, drinking socially for a number of years and then crossing over a line into alcoholism. And I remember thinking, I don't think I've ever done, I don't think I've ever did that. I think if there was a line to cross over, I probably crossed it over 30 seconds after my first drink. And, but I was thinking, you know, did, was there ever a time? And I'm trying to search back through my past for for one, just one instance where I'm out partying with my buddies, you know, or maybe in some guy's basement, smoking a little pot, doing a couple lines, drinking some wine. Maybe I'm at the bar shooting pool and doing shots and beers with my buddies like I like to do. Has there ever been a time when I've been drinking for about an hour and someone said to me, hey, Bob, can I buy you another drink? Has there ever been a time when I looked at them and thought to myself, no, you know, I'm good here. Thanks. (laughs) I couldn't find one time. Not one. You'd think there'd be one. But I always have that reaction to alcohol. I always now any time I've ever started drinking and stopped, it's because you're it's because the heat's on me and there's people around watching me. But I have never gotten enough. And if you can't get enough, you're compelled to have too much. And so I started getting in more and more trouble as a result of my drinking, because I don't just get drunk. I get drunk, drunk, drunk. And when I'm drunk, 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 oh, there's some stuff seems like a good idea. It's not a good idea. <laughs> And I'm a blackout drinker. Any blackout drinkers here? Oh, oh, oh. Gotta be frightening if nobody raised their hand. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I mean, the leper, I'd be the leper again, you know. I mean, uh, I, and I, I don't know. I'm, if you're like me, I don't, I never did anything good in a blackout. You know, never, nobody ever came up to me the next day and said, oh, Bob, you were so wonderful last night. <laughs> You peed in our kitchen. <laughs> Threw up my living room. You hit on my wife. Sideswiped my car. Passed out my front lawn. Stole my stash. You told everybody last night you beat B- Bruce Lee in a karate match, did you? <laughs> and oh, it's, it's, it's horrible. And, and if you're a blackout drinker and you do horrible things during blackouts that you can't remember, it's like I start drinking over my drinking which is like a perpetual motion machine. And the more I drink, the worse sobriety feels. And the more I need to drink, and the more I need to drink, the more I drink, and the more I drink, the weirder things I do. And the more I loathe myself, and the more shame I've acquired, and the more uncomfortable ability that I get inside of me. And, And I don't know what it is. I... I don't think it's alcoholism. And I started going to AA meetings, you know, and I got sent there. I, but I don't like AA. First of, first of all, I don't think I'm an alcoholic. Because every time I end up in AA, I'm in trouble. You know, and, I'm, and because I'm in trouble, 
being in a lot of trouble will open my mind up somewhat. And so I sit in the meetings and I, I, I think I need to do some, something here. So I start watching you and I listen to you and it comes very apparent to me that whatever's wrong with me is not the same thing that's wrong with you because I listened to you and you guys quit drinking and you were wonderful. You quit drinking and you laughed a lot. You quit drinking. You had great relationships. You had great business and job stuff happen to you. Your mere, your endless miracle stories and oh, the whole universe just lined up for you. <laughs> and I hated you. <laughs> but see, I know I'm not alcoholic. I know it looks like I'm alcoholic because I got a DUI. I went to jail. I. I I lose jobs. I get physically addicted to alcohol. I know that it looks like I'm an alcoholic, but I'm not an alcoholic because when I quit drinking, what happens to me is not the same thing that happens to you because when I quit drinking, abstinence feels like I'm doing time. I get so depressed. I stop drinking and I just get myself up on me and I can't get me up off of me. And I feel like I'm suffocating here because my emotions are just, I'm smothering myself with my own feelings and my own fears and my own remorse and my own craziness. And it's, it's like the creature in Alien, the movie Alien, attaches itself to your face. I just get, I just get Bob right here. <laughs> and it's not good. And it's not, and I don't fit anywhere sober. I don't. I don't know how to I don't know how to come out I don't know how to play with people sober. One of the symptoms of my of abstinence for me is all you take alcohol out of away from me and you don't give me any substitutes, I become very serious. Life is a big deal and there's nothing funny in it life and it's heavy and and I take I'd be sober for little intermittent periods of time. Do you ever go? Do you ever been sober with untreated alcoholism? Go someplace like a mall. You watch. You just look at people. They're just walking around, happy, for no reason. They're just happy, and you know why they're happy? Because they're stupid and they can't see <laughs> all the terrible things in the world. If they can see what I, I mean, I'd have to get happy like that. I'd have to lose 30 or 40 IQ points for God's sakes. <laughs> they just don't get it. Cause if they, if they saw what I saw, they would not be happy. And I don't understand what's going on with me and Silkworth. And the doctor's opinion describes guys like me pretty well. He says, we're quit drinking and you're restless. Can't get settled anywhere. I live in a world where everybody settles in and seems to be comfortable. And then there's me. Um, You ever watch a dog circle a living room trying to find its spot to lay down? I'm a dog that can't find its spot. I'm irritable, but I don't know I'm irritable, and I don't want to be irritable because irritable people irritate me. (laughs) I am not irritable. But what I am is a guy who can so clearly see how stupid everybody is. It's a gift, I guess. I don't know. (laughs) Everywhere I look, I see stupid people. I see stupid people in traffic. Oh, my God, there's stupid people in traffic. Go to the grocery store. Stupid people in the grocery store. Do you ever watch what people buy? A gallon of ice cream and a six-pack of Diet Coke. There's some stupid people in the grocery stores. <laughs> stupid people at work. And I go, I can't hold a job long because I can't suffer stupid people. I mean, they're not, they, seem, they don't seem that stupid when they hire me. But I'll tell you, it doesn't take long. Uh, and then, oh, you know, and then I'm intermittently forced to go to A meetings where they have all the stupid people grouped in Alcoholics Anonymous. Oh, my God, A was intellectually offensive to me. Oh, this happy, clappy stuff. Oh, God, it was horrible. And everybody in AA is grateful for everything. Oh, my God. I was sitting in a halfway house. I just burnt my life to the ground again. 
and I got to sit there and listen to this endless procession of members of AA tell me how wonderful their life is. I remember thinking, this is hell. <laughs> it's not just that you ruin your life and you've destroyed everything worthwhile. You have to have your face rubbed in how wonderful other people are while, you're, while, you're, while you've lost everything. Oh, God. People, they love, they love everybody. Hey, you throw that love word around like, gee, stop it. You ever, you ever been sick? Newly sober, depressed, feeling horrible, and have somebody in A come up to you and say, Has anyone told you they love you today? <laughs> oh, oh, where's the door? Where's the door? Because I don't know what the answer is to that, but you know a hug's coming, and I don't want nobody touching me, man. I don't want nobody touching me. It's creepy. Boo. Everybody in A talks, they talk about God. All the time. I'm an atheist. I kind of. I, I want to be an atheist. I'd like to be an atheist. So I'm not really an atheist. I've known some real atheists. You have to be very religious about your atheism to be a good atheist. <laughs> I can't get that much angst. What I really truly am is I'm a guy who's a, I'm an anti-religionist. I hate religious people. And I'm afraid of God. And that goes to the core of who I am. That if there was a God, and I'm, and I'm trying to take the position there's not, but if there was a God, I know something. I know he's not going to help a guy like me. Because I did some stuff. I did some shameful, horrible stuff. I really hurt some people that were really good people. I know what I am. And if there is a God, I ain't one of his guys. I know that. Yeah, I don't care what any preacher says. I don't care what it says in a book. I don't care what anybody says. I know that in the core of who I am, that I don't deserve that, that I ain't good enough for that. And so I'm the guy, if I just suspect you don't like me, I'm going to not like you first. <laughs> and so I throw God out because of how I feel about myself. And I made it their fault. I made it the church's fault. I made it I made it everybody else's fault. But it was really me. You know, I've always been the source of all my separation and conflict, even though I have a mind that puts it on people out here. It's really always me. And so I you guys talk about God and it's like, oh, no, jeez. And so I don't do anything you do here. I'm dying. I'm dying of alcoholism. I'm ruining my life. By by the time by the time I got sober in 1978, uh right before I got sober, I tried to take my own life. And I tried to take my own life because there was a hopelessness. I had finally became an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. And I didn't know that because I hadn't read the book. But I'd lost all hope. And the worst thing, that, that the one hope that was so important to me, and when it was gone, there was nothing to live for. And that was the hope that somehow, someday, some way, I'm going to control and enjoy that drinking thing like I used to. That somehow, that, that as long as I had hope that there was a party that I could jumpstart and get back to that feeling of freedom that I had had at one time, as long as I had that hope, I was okay. But once that hope had been dashed and it, it didn't, it didn't die easy for me. I went to great lengths to try to I mixed so many drugs in the mix. I, I went to therapy. I worked. I did all kinds of stuff just hoping to jumpstart that party, to get back to those good old days, and I, I can't. You know, I've never, I've never heard of a case of a real chronic alcoholic that, that has crossed over that line when alcohol stops doing that thing for you and only does that thing to you that's ever, an alcoholic that's ever been able to roll it back to the other side of that line when it does that thing for you again. 
And God knows we try, don't we? Oh my God. I think, I think, not, you know, and I, when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I introduced myself as a drug addict, and then it was a drug addict and an alcoholic. And, you know, some guy said to me, I said, I, I was introducing myself as, a, as an addict and an alcoholic, and a guy said, Oh, you're new. <laughs> I said, No, I, I, got, I got two and a half months. I'm not new. <laughs> he said, No, we know you're new, because only, only new people say that because they don't know any better. I said, no, I think I, there's a lot of, there, we, most of us are like that. He said, no, listen, let's find, find people. How many people are you going to find with over five years that introduce themselves like that? And I couldn't find anybody, so I never introduced myself like that again because I don't want anybody to think I'm new. Isn't it I'm funny? When I was 18 years old, I want everybody to think I was 25. When I was 40 years old, I wanted everybody to think I was 25. I never want to be who I am. I always want to be more than what I am or less than what I am, but I don't want to be who I am. And so I, I didn't want any identifiers that I was new because I, I wanted to look like an old head here. So I stopped saying that. And, and the truth is, I'm not two things. I did a lot of drugs, Sure. I did a lot of drugs for the same reason that Dr. Bob did a lot of drugs. He did, according to his story, he did high-powered sedatives every day of his life for 17 years. He did not drink every day. He drank. He was a periodic. But Bob wasn't a pill head. He was an alcoholic because every time he drank, the exact same thing happened to Bob that happened to Bob. He couldn't stop. I mean, for God's sakes, the day Bill Wilson called up Ann Smith and wanted to come and see Bob, he couldn't see Bob because he was taking a nap under the dining room table. You got to like a guy like that because I'm a napper. <laughs> I'll nap all kinds of play. I just, I nap anywhere. I nap in booths. I nap in, I'll nap on your front yard, front lawn, man. I just, I'm a napper. And so I got alcoholism and, and the problem, and I started, it was hard for me at first to see this abnormal reaction I have to alcohol. And then after several treatment centers and after uh, countless attempts to control this thing and failing, I started to realize, man, I can't take the, I got that thing. I got that abnormal reaction to alcohol. I can't take the first drink. For me to have a drink of alcohol is like having sex with a gorilla. I ain't done till the gorilla's done. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you, I can tell myself all night, like, I'm just going to go out and have a dance with the gorilla. And it's not going to be like that. So I get that. I have an abnormal reaction to alcohol. But what almost killed me is, and I couldn't understand, was that I have an abnormal reaction to abstinence. It's what makes me a chronic alcoholic. And my God, I didn't want to be a chronic alcoholic. I wanted to have like acute alcoholism, where the physical stabilization of the condition is, I'm good now, don't, thank you for your meetings, but I'm, I'm on my way. I wanted to be that guy. But I got alcohol. I'm a chronic alcoholic. And over time, abstinence is not good for me. It makes me crazy. And I don't know that it's making me crazy because it doesn't look to me like I'm crazy. It looks like I'm surrounded by stupid people. <laughs> right? It looks to me like the world is so horrible and hopeless that I, just, I get in these deep depressions. It looks like I'm never going to have any fun. It looks like I'm never going to have a good future. It looks like nothing ever good's going to happen to Bob. It looks like, what's the use? And so I drink again. I, I can't tell you how many times I burnt my life to the ground and, and swore to myself and coming into, checking into a detox or maybe coming to in a county jail with ink on my fingers, swearing to myself, sometimes sobbing tears of sincerity, saying to myself, I'm never touching it again. I'm never touching it again. I mean it. And three months, five months, six weeks, I don't know. I don't know how long the fuse is, but I always go back to it because of a thing called alcoholism. You know, in the original third tradition, 
the one that, you know, Wilson wrote the long form and Earl Treat wrote, wrote the short form because, and Bill agreed to adopt him because he couldn't get the, couldn't get the groups to even read the long form. My old home group used to read the long form. Oh, they're long. Oh, oh, oh yeah. You just watch it. When they start reading them, just the newcomers just start rolling their eyes going, Oh, make it stop. When are we going to get back to the good stuff about me? You know, right? They're long. So when he changed the membership requirement from the way he Wilson wrote it to the way Treat wrote it, it it's different. As we know it today, it says the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. I didn't have that when I got here. I don't even have that today. I mean, if I stop and think about it, yeah, sure, I have it. But it's I'm, it's not a piece of business in my life. Because if you take care of your alcoholism, drinking's not a piece of business anymore. Now, I stop doing AA. I get thirsty. But as long as I'm active in the steps, page 86 and 87, 12-step work with my sponsor, with my sponsees, drinking's not even on the table. But I'm an everyday member consciously because of the original membership requirement when it said membership should include all who suffer from alcoholism. I, I drank alcohol. I didn't know it. I didn't know it, but I drank alcohol because I suffered from alcoholism. And alcohol was the most immediate and the most effective medicine for this squirmy, not fitting, disconnected, depressive, anxious, worrisome state that's Bob when I ain't drinking. And I drank as alcohol treated that, and it did a heck of a job. And I do AA for the same reason that I drank alcohol. Because Alcoholics Anonymous is designed to treat my sobriety problem. And I got a sobriety problem. If, if all those years of swearing to myself and drinking again didn't show me anything at all, it, it, it beat it into me that not drinking is not enough. No matter how great my intentions are, I always go back to it. And it'll always start with alcohol. Sometimes, I mean, one time it was Two bottles of NyQuil. I, I didn't have a cold, but I felt one coming. <laughs> Got to be a little proactive. Or sometimes I just go, I just, I, my emotions, it just drive me crazy. So I go to a doctor. You know, alcoholism is a funny thing. If you were to catch me, now I'm sober over 39 years. You catch me on a bad spiritual hair day when I ain't right. And we all get those days. I don't get those days that much anymore, but we all get them from time to time. You catch me on one of those days and stick me in a psychiatrist's office and get me to honestly tell him how I feel, he's going to start writing me some stuff. <laughs> you can bet on that. But I come to Alcoholics Anonymous, so I don't need nobody to write me nothing. AA has been the most, it's been the only really, truly effective thing. But I had to face something. And this is not true of everybody in AA. I'm a, I'm a spiritually high maintenance alcoholic. And I, it used to drive me crazy because I'm lazy. And I would sit in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and I would always look for the people who do just about nothing and stay sober. I want to do what they do. <laughs> Give me a choice of going to one meeting a week just to check in. Or having a, a horrible dictator-type sponsor that's telling me what to do and criticizing me and wanting me to pay back all the money, all the money. I, I wouldn't have stolen all of that if I'd have known that. I mean, I mean, no, you know what I mean? I wouldn't have done that if I would have known one day I was going to have to pay it all back. Oh, my God. And write, write those images. Oh, I don't want it. And, the, and then here's the booby prize of all of this tedious, horrible stuff. You get to spend the rest of your life helping people you don't even like. <laughs> but I got alcoholism. And I had to, 
we all have to play the hand we're dealt here. I'm telling you, honest to God, if I could, if 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 I could just be the guy who went to a meeting once in a while and could stay sober, I would do that. Or if I could be the guy running the people that, that could just not drink and maybe smoke a little pot once in a while and not go back to drinking, I would do that. But I got I there's only one person I got to be honest with about the hand I've been dealt, and that's me. See, if I try if I try to play your hand, it'll kill me. And I've tried to play, I've tried to play the hands of other people in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, cause I, I don't, cause I'm a lazy guy and I don't want, and I don't want to be inconvenienced here. <laughs> and pay back the money. I've never paid back one dime that I didn't know in my heart of hearts that I needed the money more than they did. <laughs> But I had sponsorship that just directed me to do the right thing in spite of how I felt. You guys have taught me how to grow up. You taught me how to do something that I never, ever could do, and that's to other-center myself. From the very, very beginning, you, you pushed me into sponsoring people and doing service. I didn't want to do it. You know, I'd, I'd spent years in therapy. I was My mother was a therapist, and I went to some of the greatest psychiatrists on the planet, guys that had written books, started psychiatric movements. That's funny. The more therapy I did and the more money, my family spent probably a half million dollars on psychiatrists for me and treatment centers. And the more money they spent and the more that I did, the sicker I got the more narcissistically self-involved and self-focused I became. Till I was dying, I was, I was swimming in a cesspool of Bob. And I come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and you guys, from day one, you want me to start helping others. And, and I said to my sponsor, I said, he's hammering me to go on 12-step calls and take meetings into the detox and the jail and all this other crap. And, I said, listen, I said, listen, you know, I know what you're saying. But, you know, don't, don't you think I should work on me for a while? <laughs> and he reared back. He said, work on you. You've done quite enough of that. Stop it. <laughs> when he said that, I thought about it. I thought, you know, I have done a lot of that. If I could have been fixed, I think I'd have been fixed by now. I mean, I did every, I primal screamed. <laughs> I was hypnotized. I, I mean, I... Gestalt therapy, transactional analysis, rational emotive therapy with Ellis himself. I mean, I did all kinds of stuff. Because if it came up on the radar and I thought it was going to do something for me, because I'm a do something for me kind of guy, I took a run at it. So when I, when I come into Alcoholics Anonymous and you said, you guys said, no human power, I went, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. Because I tried. I tried. And if it could, any of that stuff would have fixed me, I wouldn't be here tonight. I'd have been fixed. But I'm not. I have alcoholism. As Chamberlain said one time, it's the burr under the saddle. It's the thing. My alcoholism is the, is the greatest blessing God will ever give one of his kids. The greatest by far. And a blessing is something that pushes you, shoves you, or sometimes drags you screaming into being more than what you were. And my alcoholism is the greatest blessing I've ever had in my life. It keeps me growing along spiritual lines. I have to grow. It's, it's grow or go. I, I, I'm an avid scuba diver. I go all over the world diving. I, I just, it's my, one of my passions. That, uh, more than anything today. And those of us that dive a lot, and I'm sure there's divers in this room, you get to know some things about marine biology. And one of the things that we encounter a lot is, is sharks. And you start learning that there's many types of sharks that God's de designed them in such a manner they cannot stand still. They can't even sleep on the bottom of the reef like other fish sleep, just lay on the bottom to sleep. They have to sleep in motion. They get involuntary tail motion, and they go out into the deep blue, and they never stop going forward. 
because if they stop, the water stops flowing over their gills and they cannot oxygenate their blood and they will literally suffocate from their lack of forward movement. Me too. <laughs> Me too. And I'm that guy. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I got really fortunate in, in 1978. I, I tried to commit suicide. And, uh, I couldn't pull it off. And I was a young kid, my 20s. And a doctor that previous year gave me a physical. And I, I got him to give me this really in-depth physical because I was, I explained to him that I had a brain tumor. <clears throat> And I, it turned out I didn't have a brain tumor. I wanted to have a brain tumor. Because if I had a brain tumor, it would have given me an, just a, an excuse for my whole life. I could have went to my parents and say, you think I'm a bum? I have a brain tumor. <laughs> All my ex-girlfriends had come running back, properly ashamed of themselves. But I, he said, I, you don't have a brain tumor. You don't have cancer at all. He said, kid, what you have is alcoholism. And... If you keep drinking, it's going to kill you. But he said, you're young enough that you bounce back physically. He said, it may take five years. And I came to in the park in that hopeless condition of mind and body. I came to in the park with that, the book refers to it as pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. There's no hope anywhere. I can't, I, there's no more relief in getting high. I can drink till I pass out. I just can't get free no more. And there's nowhere to go. As my sponsor says, no friendly direction anywhere. And it's something, I thought about that doctor five more years, and I thought, man, something inside me snapped. I thought, I couldn't do five more weeks of this. I made the decision to kill myself. But I couldn't do it. And I, this, I went to this bridge in Pittsburgh <clears throat> along the river, and I'm standing on this bridge looking down at these railroad tracks, maybe 100 feet below if, or less. And I got this terror gripped me. And it wasn't that I was going to die. I, I don't, I want to die. The terror was that this might not be high enough. The terror is that with my streak of bad luck, I won't die. I'll end up paralyzed from the neck down and I'll lay in some charity ward for 50 years where no one will bring me a drink. <laughs> and I'll lay there and my mind will play the movies of every pathetic, shameful, disgusting thing I've ever done. And I can't even get free. And that terrified me. If there had been a little plaque on that bridge that said, 100% of the people who jumped from here are dead, I'd have jumped. But that, that fear of not dying terrified me. I've been trying to drink myself to death for some time, and I, I know there's a lot of people in this room, I'm sure, that you're kind of hope-to-die people. All those mornings where you woke up and you cut, you wish you didn't. But... Drinking yourself to death is, is hard. It's tedious. It takes a long time. It, it's like being kicked to death by rabbits. It just goes on and on and on. That's why so many of us start thinking about offing ourselves. Man, I can't hang. <clears throat> and I got sober and I got this sponsor who was a fanatic for men's. He was, and he wanted me to, he wanted me to pray. I tried to explain it to him that I, I can't pray because I don't believe in God. He says, I didn't ask you to believe in God. I asked you to pray. I said, well, my, you know, if I pray and I don't believe in God, I'd be a hypocrite. He said, you've been a hypocrite all your life. What's the difference? <laughs> and I started taking actions I didn't believe in. And I, there's a line in, in we agnostics. That I, it, it, when, it, when this line really hit me, it brought tears to my eyes. It says, God does not make hard terms with those who seek him. I don't even believe in God, but I'm taking these silly little actions I don't think are going to work 
And God came the rest of the way right into my life. Right into my, with the, the endless series of coincidences that started happening. They were hard to ignore. And I eventually came to believe. My sponsor wanted me to, he wanted me to turn myself in and offer to do the two years in prison back in Pennsylvania, which I thought there's, there's moments when you know you got a bad sponsor. But he convinced me that I'm not gonna st- I'm not gonna stay sober looking over my shoulder. That the anxiety of worrying about that was gonna drive me back to drinking. And I knew he was right. I-, I can I can recognize the truth. I just don't like it most of the time. And he he got me to do that, and I didn't have to do the two years. It was I, it blew my mind because I my in my mind I was sure I was gonna do the two years. He got me to start making amends to my parents. I tried to explain to him it was too late. I, my mother and I came from wonderful, wonderful parents. They weren't perfect, but they were, they loved me. They sacrificed for me. They, they almost bankrupted themselves trying to put me through treatment centers and therapy and bail bondsmen and lawyers. And, you know, it was a funny <clears throat> little sidebar. I have a younger sister who, at one time, I, I was her, like her hero, I guess, and I was her big brother. And then I, I hurt her really badly, and I, I went to her, at, I was sober a little while, and I went to her to make amends. And I was talking in detail, I was, uh, my regrets about how the, some of the horrible things I'd done, the money I'd stolen from her, and the, 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 just the bad stuff I did. Just I was a terrible, terrible brother. And then I tried to I did, I did the thing you're not supposed to do. You never screw up an amends with an excuse or a justification. And I did, I tried to give it a, I said, I said, well, March, I said, I said, the reason I, I guess I, I, I acted like I hated you. It wasn't that I hated you. I was jealous because I knew, I knew mom and dad, you were so good. I knew they loved you a lot more than they loved me. And when I said that to her, she got mad at me. She said, how dare you say that? She said, I couldn't win with them because of you. I'd come home in the, the, head, the honor roll, and I'd want to show them my report card, and they'd say, not now, Marge. We've got to go bail your brother out of jail. No matter, she said, no matter what I did, you got all the attention, you got all the money, you got everything. And it blew my mind. I never looked at it that way. And it starts, I start looking at things from the viewpoint of other people in my life. The whole resentment list is about that. It's about looking at these resentments from an entirely different angle. Sponsoring people is what brings that to a higher level. When you start realizing that you've got people in your life that are looking at you as an example of AA. When you wake up to that, I'll tell you, you'll stop texting in the meetings. It's either that or you think everybody should be doing it during the meeting. You'll stop doing things in Alcoholics Anonymous that you don't want other people to do. But selfish, self-centered people, I never see past myself. And I got a million excuses for anything I feel like doing. But when I started waking up to a consciousness that included you and often looked at me through your eyes, the whole game changes here. The whole game changes here. And I started growing up. And I, you guys taught me how to go to work. I, I, one of the things that uh, became, that was kind of weird you know, Chuck, Ch- I was just talking about Chamberlain told me some, I had a short little five minute, less than 10 minute conversation with Chuck at a time when I was getting ready, ready to quit my ninth job in, in the first four years of my sobriety. That speaks volumes of untreated alcoholism right there. And Chuck told me some things that turned my life around. He told me, he said, kid, 
He said, what you're getting paid and how much you're appreciated is none of your business. You got to go to work for one reason, and that's to help God's kids. You go to work to be of service, period. And I started getting up in the morning and asking God to help me to do that, to help me to, as it says in the prayer of St. Francis, this thing about self-forgetting and go in there to be a servant. And my life took off. And it, it was so, it was astounding. I started becoming so successful. I ended up running the place I was in. They ran into a, and it parlayed into a partnership to own my own company and, and just expanding and expanding and expanding. And, but you know, I don't, I heard a guy say this one time that the, Chamberlain actually, I heard him say it. He said, there's, there's only one thing worse for an alcoholic than misfortune. And that's good fortune. Yeah. I had a guy, as I started to get really kind of well off materially, and a lot of things started happening that were very cool. I had a guy, a sponsor, come up to me one time, and he said to me, he said, you know, all this money, property, prestige, aren't you afraid this is going to go to your head? And what came, I don't even think I heard the words I said, but it was it was the truth came out of my mouth. I said, well, where, where else would it go? That's the nature of an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. I'm always trying to feed the things that should be starved and starve the things that should be fed. By the time I was 19 years sober, I, my 19th year of sobriety, materially, I, I don't, can't imagine I would ever have a year where I made that much money again. It, it was it was embarrassing. I, I was running out of things to think about to buy. It was crazy. And in the middle of this this embarrassing decadent abundance, I started sinking into a terrible, frightening depression, which made no sense to me because I have everything out here that I want. And I don't know what's wrong with me. And it's frightening. And I went to a meeting. And I ran into a buddy of mine that I got, he got sober around the same time, a little before me. And I'm telling him about this depression. And he said, so, he said something, it was bizarre. He said to me, he said, yeah, he said, you know, you run your mouth a lot in AA. And sponsor a few people. I think you want the bragging rights of that. He still go to some meetings. He said, but I don't think your primary purpose is helping God's kids anymore. He said, I think your primary purpose is you. <sighs> you know, they say the truth will set you free. <laughs> It'll ruin your day first, though, man. Because <laughs> that, that pierced me, man, because that was exact. It was my toys and my property and me, 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 me. I, I somehow incrementally shifted from being a servant whose life was about helping other drunks back to just being the center of the universe again. And I didn't even know that it happened to me. And that's frightening. That's why I will always need a... I got a strong sponsor, I'm telling you. Wait, there's a guy here, the same sponsor I have. It, it, my sponsor is wonderful. He, he doesn't care how I feel at all. <laughs> he doesn't even care. I mean, there's occasions where if he doesn't have a lot of calls backed up, he'll maybe indulge and listen to it for a couple of minutes, but he kind of turns on his aha uh -huh machine, you know. Uh -huh. But he's very, very concerned with what I'm doing. Am I making my commitments? Am I going to my home group? Am I returning the phone calls? How am I acting in AA? Am I acting like someone I could be proud to be an example of? Am I acting like a good example of Alcoholics Anonymous? Or am I acting like a selfish, self-serving guy? When I'm wrong, am I promptly admitting it? You know, we, we grow from being wrong. Nobody grows from being right. Because if that was true, it'd say in our literature somewhere, and when we were right, promptly admitted it. <laughs> I don't say that. It's when we were wrong. 
And I grow by, I grow spiritually by my willingness to be wrong because it right sizes me. Because there's only one problem, and Chamberlain used to say it, it contains all problems, and that's conscious and unconscious separation between me and you and me and God. And what's between me and you and God? Me. That's always the problem. I got too much of me between me and you. And I got too much of me between me and God. That's why untreated alcoholism is such a lonely, lonely business in this, as Wilson calls it, a state of anxious apartness where it's all of you and then there's me and I'm anxious to connect with you and I can't do it. And that is the problem. And so this, I grow, I've grown here not by learning stuff. I grow here by self-reduction. I grow here by shrinking, Bob. You want to get closer to God, shrink you. Get smaller. And as I get smaller, I get closer to God. And I get closer to you. If I'm not, a, if I'm not all of that in a bag of chips, I don't have problems with you. Right? If I'm not all of that in a bag of chips, I don't have problems with God because I'm just trying to be a servant. I'm trying to help his kids. But when I fill up with me, and I do, you know, it, my nature, my basic nature is like I'm the back of a toilet tank. I can work the steps and it like flushes it out and just empties out. And I just automatically just start filling up with me again. <laughs> You know, that's why so many of us have this weird experience. You can listen to a fifth step. Spend a whole whole day with a guy. I feel so spiritual. I should have a tent and a tambourine. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm just lit up, man. I'm connected. Go to my home group that night. And there's somebody who didn't hear the cell phone turn off announcement. And that guy had four cups of coffee and didn't put any money in the basket. <laughs> oh my God, as she's walking around in the meeting, doesn't she, everybody's seen her new set. Why don't she sit down? <laughs> huh? And what happens is I start playing God. That's one of the th first things is, first of all, we had to quit playing God. I don't know I'm doing that. But I climb up under the throne of judgment. And I start, you can measure my distance from people. You can measure my distance from surrender, from the decision in step three, and from God by the amount of opinions and judgments in my life. Oh, my God. What would it, what would I, I would, if I could just live the 10th tradition and have no opinions? Oh, my God. I'd be I'd be Gandhi. <laughs> I just I just hum myself into Nirvana. I mean, I just... so I I have daily exercises. I do page eighty six and eighty seven. Uh, I sponsor guys. I show up for commitments. The more inconvenient, the better. I let God. Do stuff with me. And my life's very good. I mean, it's really very, very good. I, I, I can have a bad day, and it's not because life's giving me a bad day. It's because I'm full of me. That's why it's a bad day. There's never been anything wrong. I'll tell you this one little thing I'm going to end. Wilson says this thing in the book about, we talk a lot about problems. He said, well, it's because... We are problem people. My ego has to find, it's always checking my future because it has to find problems. Because if it doesn't have problems to monkey with, it, it's terrified that it will recede into obscurity. It has to have something to play God about. But what if it's an illusion? What if there never has been a problem in my life and anything that bad has happened, it's because I've gotten in there and monkeyed with my life and made the bad thing happen. Or as the psychiatrists say, self-filling prophecies. 
What if the book is true when it says that our misery is of our own making? What if what Dr. Paul said was true, that if you leave your problems alone and you go out and help God's kids, your problems will die of neglect? What if they're never, what if I've always been in the Garden of Eden and I just didn't know it because i got a mind that keeps blemishing life? What if this is paradise and I'm just the only one that doesn't know it? I had a friend uh, who was a pilot. He told me a story years ago about he was in this small plane and he hit a wind shear and it spun him out of control into a tailspin. So it was the most frightening thing he'd ever experienced. He said every instinct in him was to pull back on that rudder. But he knew that if he did that, he would crash and die for sure. That what he must do was completely against all his emotions. He had to push the the stick forward and let it bounce back on its own and let go. And that plane was created by its creator to right itself. What if my life is really like that, but you don't get to know it until you trust God enough to take your hands off of it? What if this really is the Garden of Eden? It has been for me. And if you're new, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, We got good news, and we got some bad news. The good news is this really is an effective treatment. If you put all your chips in the pot, completely give yourself to this simple program, Alcoholics Anonymous is an effective treatment for everything that's been wrong with you, inside you, that drove you to alcohol and drugs. The bad news is that the treatment here doesn't work as fast as five shots of tequila. (laughs) Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.